This week on the Back Table Podcast. I think what you don't hear enough about is the small OBL, a tiny office OBL run yeah. by one person, you know, with a few staff. I can tell you, I did this in Scottsdale and spent those that Thursday and Friday for about a year and a half. And I had three FTEs with 2,500 square feet of space. If you can put that together, if you can finance your C-arm furniture, you get some computers and you're ready to go. Now, if you can do four cases a week, but how many cases do you do a week in a hospital system, right? <laughs> so it's a totally different way of thinking. If you can do four embolization cases a week, then you could take home $50,000 a month. If we can just talk real wow. numbers here. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter or email to let us know how we can make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. Uh, I started taking AG1 because quite frankly, uh, they advertise with us and send it to me for free. And, uh, and because my friends, Aaron and Sabine use it, but truth be told, you know, I've been taking it for, you know, probably 75 days now and, uh, and I'm not stopping. Uh, you guys still taking it? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. What's yeah. your experience been like? And, you know, I honestly, I, well, I thought that maybe it would taste bad or something when I first got it and I really like the taste. So it's kind of a pleasant uh, drink for me in the morning and I feel like I'm drinking something really healthy. It's really green. Yeah. I mean, it's literally that and coffee. I mean, I don't like Mike, we always joke that maybe there's something addictive in the athletic <laughs> greens itself, but, um, it, my body like, um, like craves it every day. Uh, and, and it's easy to take, it's a great presentation and, you know, I, I, I feel confident that I know I'm, I don't, you know, I don't need to eat a salad that day. Like I'm getting everything my body needs. No, totally. I agree. And uh, for me, it uh, is at least partially mental in the sense that like, you know, you, you see what's in this, you read the back of it. I'm like, this uh, hopefully will counteract the the damage I'm doing to myself on a weekend of call. Uh, and, and I, you know, I'd say this jokingly, I'm a success story. You don't actually have to be an athlete to get effects from athletic greens. So for me, it's more of an academic greens. Uh, it supports <laughs> mental health and clarity. And you can tell from how, you know, my clarity right now that it's, it's working. <laughs> that's, that's great. I, I love that. It actually helps recovery from a bad weekend call, not necessarily a workout, but a bad weekend of call. No, you don't even yeah. have to work out. Yeah, I'm, I'm no. living proof. All um, that, all that food, all that junk food you eat on call, and you can at least say, tell yourself, okay, I, I had a, I had a three glasses of athletic greens over the weekend. Like I'm, I'm, I'm okay. No, it's good. You know, it, it's, it's, it's low calorie, low sugar, and to me, it tastes like uh, a little bit like a pina colada without the alcohol. And so, you know, I, I get back on that horse on Monday after a weekend of call, and 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 this makes me feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm getting close to my baseline. I'm getting a little bit better. But to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash backtablevi. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash backtablevi to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now, back to the episode. This is Michael Barraza, returning as your host, recording from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Today, we're going to be talking about genicular artery embolization or, or GAE and building a GAE practice in the outpatient setting. And it's an honor to welcome our guest, Dr. David Wood, to share his experience. Dr. Wood is an interventional radiologist and director of medical operations at Advantage IR. David, thank you for sharing your weekend and experience with us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you told me you're, you're where today? I am in Scottsdale. I'm in our Scottsdale clinic. And do you spend most of your time like, in the Scottsdale area? Yeah, we have a corporate office. There our company's corporate office is in Chandler. So I kind of go back and forth between our Scottsdale office and our Chandler office. And I live in North Central Phoenix. So it's a little bit of driving around there, but it's, it's not bad. Uh, traffic situation in Phoenix is usually pretty good. Not too bad. All right. Well, we've done a couple episodes before on GAE. Uh, and so I encourage our listeners to check them out. We did uh, episode number 27 with Sonny Baglin, Ari Isaacson, and then 
episode 85 with Dr. Golzarian. Um, but we recorded those in, you know, 2018 and, and 2020, and GAE looks, looks different in 2022. You know, we've got a lot more centers that are offering it, and we've got more and more and better data to support it. Um, but your experience is pretty unique doing this in the OBL rather than an academic or other hospital-based setting, which is, you know, where we, we first started to hear about these. And so I'm looking forward to hearing about that element of your practice. But before we do that, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about your practice itself. Um, David, you spent, if I'm correct, 11 years as the chief of IR at a large medical center, um, you know, Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix. Can you share your story of, of how and why you made the move to the outpatient setting and, and what that transition was like? Absolutely. So uh, I finished training in 2004, and I spent the following 13 years in uh, 100% IR. I, I did 100% IR right out of uh, fellowship. 11 of those years were spent at Banner. It was called Banner Good Samaritan Medical Center in Phoenix. Turned into Banner University Medical Center when Banner Health acquired the University of Arizona Health System. Uh, so I was there through that transition. We took it, it was kind of a collapse of the radiology group there that uh, brought uh, Kevin Hirsch and I in. Kevin Hirsch, IR stud, did med school and residency and fellowship together. We did all that at USC. Um, and he recruited me to come join him to rebuild the radiology department. And, and we did 100% IR right from the start. Uh, so we already had inherited Y90 from Charlie Nutting, who had been at that hospital, but had left by the time I started there in 2006. Okay. And he had started us with Therosphere and Surfsphere there. And uh, so we dove right into that and had a great time um, treating, uh, I think over 100, maybe 100, and, 100 to 150 injections of Y90 a year, which you know was a big volume for me and n not something I had ever done before. So. Learned about that and kind of evolved to the point where we were uh, selected to be the third center of excellence for Therosphere. Wow. MDS Nordion owned Therosphere. Outside of Northwestern and Mount Sinai, we were the third center of excellence and it kind of served that purpose in the West for the company. And we did that for a few years up till 2017 uh, was when I left. And uh, I had kind of uh, gotten restless, you know, through those 11 years there at Banner University, knowing that, you know, I was dealing with all the hospital inefficiencies that we're used to, striving to improve the patient experience and kind of just gain more like emotional ownership over the the whole thing, totally. uh, the whole patient journey. And uh, that was clear that that wasn't going to happen in a hospital setting. We were hospital employees. You know, we were not, not even, we were Banner Health employees. We were not even part of a radiology group there. And so we really had no control uh, over kind of the way the patients were treated. So they, the guys there, uh, just these IR studs let me work half time, had a part time two days a week while I uh, dabbled in what could I do outpatient? And there wasn't sure. you know, an instruction manual for that. I kind of went through some unsavory, unsavory characters, um, met some some bad people, in, like healthcare business people. Sure, um, got involved with surgery centers um, that didn't work, um, and ended up getting recruited by Modern Vascular. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was one of Modern Vascular's first doctors, besides Scott Brannon, and worked one of their first clinics in uh, Mesa, Arizona, right next to Phoenix. And so all of, pretty much all of the year 2018, I worked at Modern Vascular and learned PAD, learned, you know, CLI, uh, pedal plantar loop, really hadn't yeah. done that at all. And it was really valuable experience. Um, I learned from Scott Brannon, kind of his pearls on, on doing those treatments. And I did I don't know, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of cases there, um, stayed just pretty much exactly one, exactly one year. And the guy who recruited me to Modern Vascular, businessman, he left right after I started. And he and I had hit it off. And he went off and did some of his own things in the uh, outpatient world, kind of in surgery centers. And then I left Modern Vascular after being there a year. And we were like, hey, you know, let's, let's see if we can make something else work. Let's see if we can take what we've, you know, the best of what we've learned at Modern Vascular, leave out the worst of what Modern Vascular has and 
and form our own thing where we don't just treat PAD, but we also bring the best of our embolization technologies to an outpatient clinic all under one roof. And, and this is when? So that was pretty much early 2019. And we spent the first part of 2019 opening a clinic in Austin. And, you know, it took okay. several months. So got that Austin clinic open in August of 2019. We had a non-compete with, um, with the modern vascular management, keeping us out of, well, keeping the, the CEO that I partnered with had a non-compete. So sure. he could not be involved in IR in Arizona. I could. So we opened the Austin Advantage IR clinic. In the meantime, I opened my own OBL here in Scottsdale, the one I'm sitting in now. And uh, I had to run that by myself. That could not be part of Advantage IR. It had to be arm's length. So I spent three days a week in Austin every week through maybe six months through 2019 and, and early 2020. And then I spent Thursdays and Fridays here in Scottsdale in my own OBL. And so that was the beginning of Advantage IR? That's how it started. Unfortunately, that, that time period you may recognize early 2020 was the beginning of COVID. Right. Which was, you know, a stressful time for everybody. Uh, we got through that. We certainly slowed down, got through that. In the meantime, we were making preparations to open another clinic in El Paso, Texas. And that clinic did open in yeah, I read that. February 2020, right, right when COVID started. <laughs> um, great timing. <laughs> yeah. So as some if, crazy you know, times. starting an OBL from the ground up more challenging as, you know, as it is. Right. And we survived that time at the El Paso clinic actually just took off even with COVID. There's really? just such a need there. There's such a need in El Paso for healthcare. A lot of, a lot of doctors in El Paso fly in. They just parachute in for a couple of days a week and then leave and don't live there. And that's just an example of kind of how the, the healthcare system in El Paso is struggling. I think it's, it's kind of that way for other border cities, just El Paso being one of the bigger ones. So that clinic did well, even through COVID, and it continues to be our, our best performing clinic now. Really? Advantage IR is, is, is not like all the other OBLs out there. You guys have a, a unique group of procedures that you guys are offering. You know, it's not just legs and dialysis. Um, what else are you guys doing? Well, uh, we actually don't do any dialysis, uh, kind of because that's, it, it's really regional. I'm sure, you know, the outpatient dialysis, you know, fistula treatment, but in Arizona, uh, it's completely owned by the nephrology groups, huge nephrology groups. And in Texas, it varies by city, but it's really hard to get those cases. Um, so we just do our arterial procedures. You know, I like arterial procedures. We do PAEs, UFEs, of course, PAD, uh, so leg arteries, CLI, the, the whole thing, GAE, and frozen shoulder embolization, and hemorrhoid artery embolization. So I think that was six. So those are the six arterial treatments that we offer. Uh, we will also do venous embolizations, uh, varicocele, and pelvic congestion embolizations. So I really like embolizations. I really like arterial procedures. That's our focus. And I, I should mention that the non-compete ended in September of 2020. And so I took my OBL in Scottsdale and merged it in with Advantage IR. Mm -hmm. That's how the Scottsdale clinic okay. joined Advantage IR. Understood. Well, so what's the plan with Advantage IR moving forward? Do you guys plan to continue expansion? Absolutely. Continue expanding. Uh, we're going to open a second OBL in Phoenix, in the west side of Phoenix, in a few months. Uh, that OBL is just being developed, being built out. Um, in other cities, uh, not sure. We're thinking about Omaha. Um, we've gone through kind of a period of planning what we're going to do in the future, planning uh, more like not just our one or, or five-year approach, but our 30-year our approach to... Yeah know, where we're going to sit in healthcare. And maybe we can talk more about that later. Um, but that's, so we've, we've had a period of about eight months where we haven't uh, opened or, or even made strides to open a new OBL in a new city. But I think we're starting a new growth phase now. 
and we're just figuring out what city that's going to be. Okay. David, a lot of our listeners are, are trainees who are going to be looking for jobs soon or are currently looking for jobs. And I was wondering if you have any advice for those that are hoping to either begin their careers or transition into the outpatient setting. Like, how should they go about looking for a position in a practice that looks like yours? You know, I would actually, uh, I, you know, I'd love to talk to someone about joining us, but I would also encourage young IR docs to think about opening their own. You would be surprised how lean you can make these places. You know, we, really? we all hear at we go to conferences and hear about the big OBLs that are super busy, have, have lots of doctors working them, lots of staff, maybe multiple locations. But I think what you don't hear enough about is the small OBL, a tiny office OBL run yeah. by one person, you know, with a few staff. So I can tell you, I did this in Scottsdale and spent those that Thursday and Friday for a year, year, a year, about a year and a half. I spent every Thursday and Friday in my Scottsdale clinic. And I can tell you that with three employees, I had three FTEs with 2,500 square feet of space. And it, I, if you can put that together, if you can finance your C-arm and uh, do four cases a week. So imagine that. So imagine three FTEs. It's, it's a doctor's office. This, yeah. It's not an ASC. It, this, this is easy, easy stuff to open. You just find space to lease. Um, I did it with 2,500 square feet. I had four consult rooms. I had a procedure room that was 16 by 20. I have four recovery bays and a C-arm. You get some supplies, you get some furniture, you get some computers, and you're ready to go. Now, if you can do four cases a week, you know, and imagine that, how, how many cases do you do a week in a hospital system, <laughs> right? So it's a totally different way of thinking. If you can do four embolization cases a week, then you could take home $50,000 a month. If we can just talk real wow. numbers here. Yeah. I think people should know these numbers um, totally. because um, I think that it's that secrets getting out there that, that embolizations pay really well in offices and insurance companies love that. They want these things done in your office, you know, your, oh, absolutely. your independent IR doc office, because that is the cheapest place that these treatments can get done, you know, for Medicare or for commercial insurance companies. And yet it's, it's quite a windfall for the IR, for an independent IR doc who's working solo. Uh, so you can, you can, you can get a hundred thousand in revenue. You could count on a hundred thousand in revenue per month and the expenses could be about 50,000 a month. So you could take home 50,000 a month for working two days a week, consults on Thursday, Incredible. procedures on Friday. And so that works out to 600,000 a year. And if you consider the, the salary for an IR doc working two days a week, let's say, uh, <laughs> let's say five days a week is 500,000, right? So let's say 200,000, you're bringing home 600,000, 200,000 of that is market salary. So there's 400,000 of profit there, uh, for just two days a week of work. The catch is, can you get four cases a week? You know, and that's actually not not that easy. You have to make sure. sure that you can do that. So I would encourage trainee IR docs to get a start in a community. You really have to know people in your community. You got to get to know doctors. My wife's an OBGYN that definitely, she, she trained at the, at Banner University residency for OBGYN. And then she stayed there and she's one of the attendings there now. So yeah, that has helped me get to know OBGYNs in my community. A lot of them stay, you know, a lot of those residents stay. That's, that's what you do. You, you just, you make relationships, you make partnerships where you can, and you do good work. And, uh, it's, and if it's a big city like Phoenix is, then yeah, you could get four, you could get even four UFIs a week. You know, I, I get a, I, I was getting a combination of UFIs and pelvic congestion embolizations at that time. And that probably made up almost all of my cases. And I was not doing four days a week, every week. There were weeks I did one case a week, you know, um, and there were, there were weeks that I did five or six. I don't think I could say that I averaged four cases a week, but someone who, who could, could actually do really well working two days a week and expand into the other days. Sure. You know, you could expand into those other three days, or you could do something else those other three days of the week. Or you could just do nothing, 
and have the, the greatest job <laughs> in the world, right? <laughs> I think that trainees need to know that it's actually not out of their reach. Uh, I think that they should work a few years in a community, get, get mentored by uh, a group of IR docs, and then think about um, taking the plunge. If, that's, if they were so inclined, if you had that kind of risk tolerance and that seemed like uh, an attractive you know, thing to do with your career, it's a little risky, but you look what you have to fall back on. You're a radiologist. Right. It does make a lot of sense, though, to, you know, work for a few years in a community and then consider, you know, going to the outpatient setting in that community where you have those connections, those partnerships, as you mentioned. I would imagine it's harder to start this in a, in a brand new city where you don't know any of the other physicians. I think that would be really hard. Yeah, it's doable. But, um, you know, you don't want to, if you're starting your own practice, you, you really don't have a marketing budget. You can't hire a liaison to go visit. Sure. Maybe you can, but it would, it would be tough. You know, I think that you could start your own OBL with a hundred thousand in cash. The initial McKesson order is just eye popping. You know, it's, if you take bare shelves and fill it with all the stuff you need from McKesson, that by itself is probably 50,000. You can't really, I believe it. you can't really finance that, you know, you can finance everything else. You can finance the furniture, the computers, the C-arm, um, the gurneys, the exam tables the chairs and desks. Um, so you do need some cash and you do, you do need some relationships. You need to know that you're going to hit the ground running a little bit. That's a great answer, uh, to that question. And I think that gives us some good background to start talking about uh, GAE and the OBL. So first of all, you know, why GAE? You know, what makes this a good procedure to do in the OBL? What's really attractive about GAEs to me is that they're, they're actually technically pretty easy procedures. Yeah. I don't want to minimize it. It's a procedure. It's an arterial procedure. But if you started out um, tackling prostate Artery embolizations, which to me, I think are technically pretty difficult. They can yes. be, right? So, and I tackled that, you know, I, I think we all have a, come to a time where we, we tackle PAEs and, you know, if you're, if you're working in OBL, you gotta, you gotta do PAEs. And, uh, so when you go from a PAE after PAEs kind of predated GAEs by a couple years, few years, uh, so then when you when you're thinking about GAE, it's, it's a lot more straightforward. The anatomy, you know, you can usually get a case thoroughly treated and done in 45 minutes. It's, it's very easy for patients to go through the treatment. You could do it with very little sedation or even no sedation, discharge right away. And probably the beautiful thing is that there's very little side effect yeah. um, and, and very little complication. So, though know, the risk, the therapeutic window you know, is a good term for that. It's a wide therapeutic window when you're talking about GAEs because the risk is actually very, very low. Um, right. The upside is very high. So for technical reasons, you can get a patient in and out. You don't have a long recovery. The UFI recoveries are a little longer uh, for me anyway. And just in, in every way, you don't need advanced imaging. You could do GAEs with a pretty basic vascular package on a mobile C-arm. No problem. You don't need, you know, there's no question about needing cone beam CT when it comes to GAEs. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, about, you know, the, um, the advantage of this being, you know, a, a low likelihood of, of complications, you know, you compare it to doing, you know, say, uh, iliac artery recanalization. I mean, that could be scary. You can occasionally get a rupture. Yeah. You're not going to get anything like that in a GAE. You're just going to get down there, go in the, you know, around the knee to your embolization and that's it. It's, it's a beautiful... It's a beautiful procedure and the frozen shoulder embolization is a little, takes a little longer. Okay. Um, it can be a little more tedious, but you, you know, for those reasons you could, I, I just imagine it, if GAE takes off and it becomes a, a really commonly done procedure, it's the kind of thing that can, you could do many a day, like you could I do totally many, agree. many GAEs in a day. Uh, and so it's, it's really kind of staggering to think about the future that GAE could have. It's just I agree the size, the right the the well, I mean, size of the market. To, 
Absolutely. And not only the size of the market, you compare it to UAE or PAE, you're not really, comp you're not offering really a competing therapy, in my opinion, you know? I mean, you're, you're not, this isn't an alternative, it's like UAE is an alternative to hysterectomy. You're, you're helping a, a challenging patient population. And this is not something that I think that we would be fighting with, you know, orthopedics or PM&R or, you know, pain management. I think this would be, you know, these people would be very pleased to send these patients to get a therapy that's going to work. Yeah. And that's, that's also why patients are running at it. You know, that's the key of P G A E is similar to P A E in a few respects. One, these, these are what make treatments great for OBLs. One patients know the name of their disease. Uh, you can't say that about everything we do. Um, totally. but patients do know that they have arthritis in the knee. So it's similar. It, uh, you know, so I'm going to name three things, uh, and they're true about P A E as well. So the G8, so they know the name of their disease. Two, it's a very common disease. And three, patients have declined treatments that have been offered to them. And so you have uh, a cohort of patients that number in the millions uh, who know, know their disease, they're suffering from it every day, and yet they've declined what they've been offered. So they're continuing to suffer untreated. And you could, you could say that about PAE as well. Um, but that's, you know, that, that makes the, when you look at it that way, that kind of shows how, how staggering the GAE volume could be absolutely you know, worldwide. Uh, patients are running at this. They really need this. Uh, patients, most of the patients we see, and especially in El Paso, are suffering. Uh, we just looked at all of our GAE data. We had done 220 GAEs in the year 2021. Wow. And we, we looked at the, and I think half, half of those are in El Paso. No kidding. And we looked at our median VAS, VAS score. It's nine. Our median VAS is nine, which means you have just as many tens, right? If I'm doing this right, you have just as many tens as you have less than nines. Right. So you have just as many tens as you have five through eights, because um, we wouldn't do it uh, for below five. Uh, so that's, that just is an example of the scope of the problem and how patients are just desperate for something that'll work. So once you decided to take this on, how did you promote or market the procedure? Basically, what did you do to start getting patients in the door for this? Really, uh, we always market to doctor's offices. We have liaisons who do that. But I can tell you that's one thing that doesn't work that well. No, it's, this sounds crazy to doctors, honestly. If you go to a doctor and tell them you're going to s slow down or stop the blood flow into the knee joint to treat arthritis pain, they look at you, probably like a lot of, a lot of us IR docs kind of thought about it too. It just sounds crazy. And how could that, why could that be a thing? So it can, it takes a while to get PCPs to adapt this as in their treatment, you know, in their management strategy. Yes. I've had that same experience. I, yeah. I gave a talk to a PCP office like two weeks ago on this. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. No one had ever heard of it. Yeah. You could actually have more luck with NPs and PAs yeah. than with doctors, you know, than, you know, um, family I doctors, for example. But we've had the most success just marketing direct to patients. So really, uh, I think it, we end up treating about a quarter of our leads. So to do 200 procedures, we need to get 800 leads. I'm talking like in a year, like in the year 2021, we did 200 procedures, took 800 leads to get there, uh, maybe eight to 900. The most successful way we got leads direct to patient was TV commercials. We actually had TV commercials in English and in Spanish. Um, and they did really well, especially the Spanish uh, language commercials that we had on TV. I think that half of our self-referred patients were from TV commercials. Okay. What proportion of self-referred patients would you say you're getting like relative to the ones that are referred? Oh, uh, it's, it's like 10 to one. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, okay. it's huge difference. Yeah. We, we didn't get that many referrals we tried, but I think we probably, you know, per quarter, I'm thinking about it in terms of like quarterly numbers. It's probably about 
200 digital leads, marketing leads versus 20, 20 or so physician referrals in a quarter. And the physician referrals, are they coming from PCPs primarily? Yes. I think, I think PCPs are uh, the highest yield referring doc uh, when it comes to GAEs. So you may wonder about orthopedic surgeons or maybe even sports medicine docs. Sports medicine docs are open to it, but they have, they have some competing interests of their own. Right. Uh, if they're doing injections, mm -hmm. um, and you can get a sports medicine doc to consider GAE if their treatments are just failing and, uh, and a patient is, is not willing to consider going to an orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgeons, I have had orthopedic surgeons send GAEs and, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we were that lucky. Um, uh, I actually haven't <laughs> met him. So I'm just, it's just one orthopedic surgeon I'm thinking of. And I know just that. Same our, with me. Yeah. I've only, I've only done two of them and then they both came from ortho. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, and there you go. I mean, I think that says a lot that orthopedic surgeons are kind of adapting it as a legitimate treatment. Um, because I think we have, a, we have a lot of shyness about that. They're, they're they have competing interests. Are they going to think that it'll ruin their surgery, you know, or, or there's their, their wounds won't heal, you know, if they do end up doing surgery. So uh, we should probably be more aggressive marketing to orthopedic surgeons. And we just haven't, we haven't yet. I think that might be a good pivot to take. How did yeah. you get those? How did you I get those? I just got, I, I just got a phone call for the first one. It, it was an orthopedic surgeon that I knew. And he, I guess, had read about it and asked me if, if it was something that we offered. And this is when I was still in Nashville. It's like, yeah. He had uh, read about it. We certainly it. can't. Yeah. Wonder where he was reading about it. The other it. one cool. was admittedly, the second one was admittedly for hemarthrosis. Uh, okay. And yeah. so uh, it was post-prosthetic hemarthrosis. And, and so he called and asked, he's like, hey, I, you know, I've heard that this might work. And we did it. Awesome. And so it worked. It worked for the hemarthrosis, I'm sure. And Yeah, it did. And maybe did, did and they I, have I, osteoarthritis? The the other one I have not seen because I moved like not long after. Right, right, okay. Um, and, you know, I, I think he got a good result, but uh, I didn't see him again. Um, so once you got started doing these, how did you manage to you know sustain or increase your referrals? Did you do anything different, or just you know repeat the commercials, more phone calls? Just we kept the commercials going. You know, we yeah. saw that we had we found something that was resonating well with patients. And so we kept going. I, I can probably tell you some interesting stats about, you know, our marketing spend. I can't tell you. So our second most successful marketing channel was just web, just web search. Yeah. Uh, we did newspaper ads. Um, we did radio ads. Those were not as fruitful in absolute numbers. Now, what is probably more important is like dollars per lead, you know, dollars spent on the marketing per lead. I don't have good numbers on that, but our company is, is trying to get, get it together to the point where we can kind of nail that down to a granular level. Um, but I can say that overall, if we had to spend about $2,500 per procedure. Sure. So to obtain that lead, you know, and see it through the procedure, ended up costing about $2,500 in marketing, which sounds pretty steep, but um, still, when it comes to embolizations, it's still arterial embolization still leaves plenty of room for a right. profit margin. Um, let's move ahead and talk for a second about your experience evaluating and, and treating these patients. So let's say you've got a full schedule of patients in your clinic that are seeking relief from knee pain. How do you go about identifying the ones who are likely to benefit from GAE? So we've evolved a little bit in this. Uh, there, there was a point where the only U.S. study was that study done by a San, Sandeep, Sonny Baglet and Ari Isaacson. And you know, they had relied on the point of maximal tenderness. So they had de decided to treat medial or lateral, depend, but not both, and depending on which of those sites was most tender. And uh, so we were doing the same thing. And if someone didn't have tenderness, we would, you know, be, we would let ourselves be guided by where their pain was maximal, whether it was medial or lateral. Um, but we would, so we would base the treatment decision on, um, pain 
and in pain at least five out of 10, so five or worse out of 10. Uh, and we need to see our osteoarthritis on an X- X-ray. Yeah. Uh, we started out requiring an MRI um, before we would, you know, as part of our patient selection and uh, patient workup. Stop doing that. That uh, article came out uh, around the, uh, in 2021 about the MR predictors of success or failure and GAE outcomes. And it made a pretty strong case uh, for x-ray being good enough, a good enough evaluation. You want to see that they have osteoarthritis, that they don't have some other cause of the pain or that it is not a normal x-ray. But there's probably not important information that you, important soft tissue information that you would need an MRI to tell you, you know, in order to select a a patient being a good candidate or not for the procedure. Uh, So we started just relying on x-ray. That that paper was surprising in that it did not show synovitis. You know, this has always been about synovitis and embolizing angiogenesis and synovitis. But that paper did not show that synovitis was a predictor of a good outcome. It actually showed the opposite. So I don't think we have the whole story on the role of synovitis. Uh, and we know that the procedure can work if there's no synovitis. On the other hand, if there's a, a synovitis with a fusion, that's, that was actually a predictor of a poor outcome in that paper. Uh, so uh, for now, I think I'm, I'm convinced that an x-ray is a good enough workup along with a patient who has moderate to severe pain. Uh, in addition to, you know, people who don't fall off the right spot on the pain scale or, or have negative x-rays, is there anything else in a patient that, you know, might suggest that he or she is not a good candidate for GAE? Well, we don't, uh, we don't treat people who have had surgery. So if they've had a total mm-hmm. knee. Now, I, I think that there could, there could come along a patient that would be a good candidate for that. And by a good candidate, I mean someone that you're willing to take a chance on. Yeah. Um, because it's not studied and we don't know. There, there is some, some anecdotal suggestion that it might help, kind of coming from Dr. Okuno in Japan. Um, but we really don't know. Now, if a patient came along that was just desperate for something and had tried everything and was in a lot of pain, then I would try it. Um, but so far, haven't done it. Anything else? I don't, I can't think of, I can't no, think I can. of any, anything else. So, you know, a lot of these patients are going to be old uh, and presumably you're going to run into some who either have no, I mean, look, let's say you get, you look at your x-rays in the knee and you see just like a ton of calcification, the distal SFA and the popliteal artery. Do you ever run into that where you see a patient with terrible knee pain, but also has, you know, symptoms of significant PAD or imaging findings that would suggest there are going to be at least some stenoses, if not some CTOs on your way down? That actually hasn't happened yet. We haven't, I know that my partners and I have not come across a patient. I'm surprised. I know, isn't that, that is a surprise. I think that we would, you know, we, we ask about symptoms of PAD. Yes, of course they could be asymptomatic. They could have severe PAD and be asymptomatic. Um, so we would do our best with physical exam to figure that out ahead of time. If there was a suggestion of PAD, even if asymptomatic, we just wouldn't do it. No, we wouldn't want to take the chance on putting that patient in jeopardy. Sure. Um, okay. When it comes to their perfusion, I can't say that it has happened. So I, you know, I would, I would say that that would be rare for just from my experience. I think that would be rare. You have to do, you should ask about PAD symptoms and you should feel their pulses. And if there's any doubt, then probe further, get a duplex see what's going on there. So like the workup for this or any procedure, of course, needs to include the determination of how these, how they're going to pay for it. Uh, And I'm curious what your experience has been like, you know, with, with insurance coverage for this procedure. It's been pretty good, actually. Most commercial insurance companies uh, will uh, say that CPT code 37243, the arterial embolization (laughs) code is uh, NAR. We get the NAR, which is no auth required. And, you know, there, there may be something, there may be a blessing there in the fact that 37243 is used for all kinds of embolizations all over the body, um, in that 
we have, when no auth is required by an insurance company, they will usually pay the claim. Yeah. Now there are insurance companies who insist on getting a pre-authorization first, you know, and even Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, so commercial, some commercial insurances and Medicare Advantage plans will do a pre-authorization. And I can tell you the opposite is true for that. When, when we request a pre-authorization, it's usually denied when it comes to GAE. And so we haven't been fighting those or appealing those uh, so far uh, that we may be coming to the point where we should start appealing those because I think there's a growing body of evidence uh, that we could, we could make the case that it is not only becoming, uh, would we say it's standard of care yet? You know, maybe not. It's still, it's still a pretty uh, cutting edge treatment. Sure. But it's better than anything else out there. You know, and I, I think that anybody, including insurance companies would agree that it's, it's better than the injections, the, the visco sub injections that they are paying and it's worth keeping a patient out of a total knee, you know, for as long as possible. So I think that the industry will come to the point where we'll be making that case and, and successfully, but I think we're in kind of a weird time right now, um, where in, it's new and to those reviewers who are doing your pre auth it's probably the first time they've seen this kind of thing requested. And we usually get denials of those. Yeah. It seems about like where PAE was a few years ago, Yeah, you know, and so hopefully it, it starts to follow the same course and, and show similar efficacy, but you know, I'm confident that this is going to be a big thing for us. I hope at least. So David, tell me how you set expectations with these patients in, you know, what you think they'll experience in terms of pain relief. That's a tough one. Um, because the success rate is not hundred percent. It's not even 90. It's not even 80. The UCLA uh, paper had a, a really high threshold for success. You know, Womack improvement by 50% and at wow. 12 months. So high threshold, but so their, their success, I think at, what was it? At a 25% improvement of Womack, I think it was 85%. So it depends on how much you want the Womack to go down or, or you want symptoms to improve. Um, but if you look at, I guess, what, it, what do you want to know if you're a patient? You want to know that your pain is going to get better, like a lot right. better, that you're not, your life's not going to be ruled by pain anymore, um, that you're not going to be kept up at night by pain, and that you're going to be able to do the activities that you want to do, um, maybe even more exercise. You know, it's critical for some patients, uh, many patients with arthritis also have issues with their uh, weight. And it's critical to, to, uh, relieve pain in their knees so they can exercise and they want to, you know, they just, they just can't cause they, it hurts so much. So what we, uh, need to do. So I tell patients that I don't get in, I don't get into how much is your, what percent is your Womack going to improve? You know, I, I tell patients that the chance of you having significant major improvement in your pain is 70%. You know, the UCLA study was 68%. I think that probably is true. A patient can get partial relief more often, higher success rate, getting partial relief. It could be 85%, but really massive sustained relief of pain is about 70%. That's not that exciting. That's pretty good. It. Is that pretty good? <laughs> I think it's pretty good for patients with severe pain, severe knee pain. And, you know, this is a minimally invasive procedure to treat it. I mean, you know, I think what are you going to get from a PRP injection? You know, what's their rate of, uh, you know, significant pain relief? I bet it's not 70. I'm sure you're right. I'm sure it's the best thing that's out there right now, short of a huge surgery. Yeah. Um, and so that, the way I look at it is that, you know, let's compare it to a, a total knee arthroplasty. You know, that is probably going to help with their pain, but it's a much more morbid procedure if there's a possibility that something that is less invasive is going to work, it's not a home run. It's not, it's not a hundred percent that it's going to get better, but if there's a chance you can get that pain taken care of with, you know, without a hospital stay, then I, I think for a lot of people, that's worth a shot. You know, even with the 30% chance, you're not going to get total pain relief. I think most patients agree. 
most patients hear 70%. They like, oh, no problem. That yeah. sounds great. But you know, I'm, yes, I'm used to you fees, you know, in IR, we're used to kind of more of a sure thing, right? We're used to you fees or PA, even PAEs, pretty high, really high success rates. Yeah. So, you know, you will find yourself sitting across from a patient who don't, don't, who won't feel like it did anything for them when it comes down to it. Uh, but on the other hand, 70% is, is good. It's a lot of patients. And when it works, it really works. And it works really? for a long time. You know, it, it does, it, it'll work for way more than a year when it does work. Wow. I had one patient. Can I tell you about? Please. Early days. This is the best kind of patient. So it was the early days I was doing it. And I think I said, we, we did GAEs for pretty much since January of 2021 is when we started them, but I actually had done a few in December of 2020. So there's a woman who came to me, she's in a wheelchair. She had um, some kind of neuropathy uh, that affected motor nerves. And so she was not able to walk. She had osteoarthritis in her knee and had tremendous pain. She's not weight bearing, you know, and, and yet she had this pain that would just gnaw at her and keep her up at night. And so we did, you know, and she was never going to have surgery when in, given her comorbidities. Right. So she was desperate for something and treated her in late December. And, and I got a call on Christmas morning and, from a patient. And as you can, I'm sure you agree that when you get a call from a patient on a, on a holiday or a weekend day, it's never good. I'm right? nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's never good news though if they're calling. Well, it was, it was a Christmas miracle. So she called to tell me that she had a Christmas miracle. She woke up Those Christmas morning best. with no pain. That's incredible. And that was huge. That, that's just an example of the kind of patient that I like to treat. It's, there are oh, millions of elderly patients who are in a tremendous pain from arthritis, who are never going to have surgery and have nothing else. You know, and this, this is the thing because it's, uh, you can you can treat a, a fairly frail, a very frail elderly person very safely and highly effective. No, I, I, that's why I really like you know procedures for pain, like for tubal augmentation. I mean, it you you can really cause like a dramatic improvement in a patient's quality of life with something like this, um, and it's certainly you know exciting prospect moving forward. As you said, you know with the the potential volume of this. In terms of actually doing them, you know, I think we can skip over a lot of the technical details that are out there, but I do have a few questions. And, and my first one, and, and the answer may be no, but are there any real differences in, uh, in terms of treating these patients for GAE and the OBL compared to the hospital, you know, in terms of technique, equipment, or anything else? I think just that it's simple. It's a lot simpler. You really don't need, you know, there's a, I guess it's a little controversial. It's not to me, but you know, whether you can do a PAE without cone beam CT. Uh, and a, a lot of the thought leaders will say, well, at least to start, you know, you should do your first 40 or your first 50 with cone beam CT or, you know, you hear things like that. No question. That is not the case for GAE. You, know, you could use a pretty simple C arm. Uh, as, I think as long as you can do DSA, you really need DSA, <laughs> but but as if you have a, C, a mobile C arm that it can do a DSA and an OBL, that's all you need. Uh, so this, I, I think that's true of all the musculoskeletal embolizations that I think we know, or it's looking like that's going to be a huge part of our career are, are these musculoskeletal embolizations and we're Achilles tendon, tennis elbow are, are all things that are next. You know, I think, oh. can you, can you imagine the how our days are going to look. And these are very enjoyable cases. They're very they're simple. Super fun. Yeah. Right. They're fun. You know, they're small arteries, you get into them and, and, you know, I, we do a lot of, uh, bone tumor embolizations where I am, you know, for renal cell meds and uh -huh. it'll be in the arm and the leg, the knee, and they are so fun. I love them. Yes. Yes, they are. They're really rewarding. They're, they're, they're personally rewarding to yeah, I see that blush. You know, and to make that blush disappear, totally. and yet you've left. You want to kind of like minimize. You want to whisper. You want to minimize your footprint. 
So you want to make that blush go away, but you want to leave the arteries open and kind of leave everything else untouched. And uh, I, I find that really rewarding and, and simple, you know, so you could do a lot of these every day and help a lot of people and, uh, and keep your, keep your clinics throughput, um, efficient, which is huge. And I think that's an important point about doing this in the OBL. One of the arguments, you know, I work in, in a hospital setting. But one of the arguments that's been made to me on this podcast and elsewhere is that for a procedure like this, you know, where it's usually pretty straightforward, it is a much smoother and faster and more comfortable patient experience. Has that been your experience? Yes. Yes. Patients are surprised. They're always surprised how quick and easy it was. And um, usually the huge smiles when they roll out, you know, and it's even too early to know if it worked, but... Right. Um, totally. You can really brighten someone's day by staying on time, you know, <laughs> and having nice people. Our motto is kindness and accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has to be their kindest self to patients and brighten everybody's day. And we've got a great team for getting that done. And uh, patients, patients are always surprised how easy the treatment was and how much they liked um, the people that they went through it with here, here in our team. When you're doing this, just a couple technical questions. Uh, do you embolize, you know, both sides of the knee? You know, how many arteries are you treating and what are you using for your embolic agent? That's, so that's another thing that's evolved a little bit for us. So I talked to one of the, so our, our results were actually a little bit lackluster and we were, we were continuing to do that treatment strategy that I described where we only treat medial or lateral, depending mm -hmm. on where the most tenderness was. And though the thought leaders now are being more aggressive, even the UCLA study treated anywhere there was pain. So they would treat medial and lateral. If there was pain, medial and lateral. If there was tenderness, medial and lateral. Or if, even if the patient just said there was pain on the inside and the outside, then they would treat medial and lateral. And, uh, I, it looks like that's what needs to be done. Uh, so actually I, I talked to someone recently who said that he treats anywhere there's angiogenesis, no matter what, no matter where their pain is, no matter where they say their pain is, and no matter where they're most tender, treat all the angiogenesis. And so we just started doing that. So that's probably going to result in more side effects. Um, a little more pain for probably up to a week, you know, at least a few days of more pain as a side effect of the procedure. Um, but it's looking like that will make the procedure more effective. Anything else, any pearls, pitfalls you've picked up and, you know, getting a couple hundred of these under your belt that, uh, that you've noticed to either, you know, optimize clinical improvement or prevent complications? Well, the ice pack, the ice pack, I think everybody knows about the ice pack. We do an ice pack in everybody. I, we haven't seen those 220 patients. We didn't have any skin erosions or ulcerations. We did have one patient. I still don't know what happened to him. Um, it might've been fat necrosis, but he developed a very inflamed red and tender firm nodule in the subcutaneous tissue around the knee. I don't know, kind of around the, the upper calf or, or lower thigh. And, uh, so a hard nodule that was tender and also really red skin and, and it was painful for him. You know, it was, it was not normal, not a normal side effect. I don't know what it was. Uh, he actually got admitted and treated for cellulitis. I'm not convinced that it was true, like bacterial cellulitis, but right. I guess it's possible. Um, but that was the only one. Other than that, we did not have any, uh, you know, and he didn't develop any ulceration. Uh, it was just what I described, the firm tender nodule. And so we've, we haven't had any, uh, like ulcerations or anything like that. We do get the bruise. I like to do the, I heard that Dr. Okuno will let the microcatheter peek out of the tip of a five French catheter, or maybe even like a four French catheter. So I'll do that without a wire. I'll just probe along mm -hmm. and, um, find with puffing and, um, find vessels that way. Sometimes you need a wire. But you can do a lot of this without a wire, you know, especially the directions. I like using directions. I like using a burn tip. I like that you can turn the tip and it, it yep. really does have that one-to-one -one torqueability. 
So I'm pretty attached to That's a great catheter. the direction, right? You can yeah. just kind of advance it and turn it. I think that when I think about what the future is going to hold for how this is going to be done, I think the key is going to be pharmacologics, right? Being able to inject, being able to give a drug into the synovium through their feeding arteries is very, is a powerful paradigm, powerful strategy. And it's just a matter of what, what that pharmacologic is going to be, because we know that we can load drugs onto microspheres and then we can bring about the slow release of those drugs into the synovium. And so what's that, what's the right thing going to be? Um, it's going to be some kind of a receptor blocker. You know, there's a lot known about the biochemistry of the signal transduction uh, and the initiation of inflammation and the persistence of inflammation. That's really well known now. And, you know, that knowledge is increasing every year. Um, but I think uh, that uh, the industry is close to trying pharmacologics along with our microsphere embolization and, you know, influence the physiology of that arthritis, osteoarthritis, you know, on a biochemical level. So I'm excited about that. I know that's, that's got to be coming. And uh, as far as what is going to stop that cycle, halt that cycle of cartilage destruction and inflammation, you know, I, I, I hope that embolization has a role in that long term. I know that pills are being uh, investigated for that purpose. And so far, no, there's nothing that's been successful at, at influencing that cycle. Um, I'm hoping that embolization or, or even drug eluding bead embolization will be part of that. So uh, after treating these patients, when do you see them back in clinic? We do one month. We do kind of like studies, one month, three months, six months. Um, we, we follow the WOMAC. So, you know, I would like to see, we, we kind of use, do patient selection and patient follow-up the same way studies did it. You know, we want to reproduce the, the UCLA study was just so good. We just want to reproduce, um, their patient selection, uh, their techniques, um, and hopefully get their results. You know, their results were really good. They got, a, I think an average Womack decrease of about 28, if I remember right. And that, that would be really good. You know, that would be tremendous for a patient. We were getting more like 20, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll take a vulnerable moment and tell you that we were taking more, we were getting more like a 20 point improvement doing it the, uh, kind of the more conservative right. early, early technique. Uh, so, uh, hopefully we'll get better results, to, uh, with our new strategy, but one month and three months, patients usually are doing better at three months versus one month. And then they kind of level off from there. And it's, it's hard for us to get patients to keep coming after three months. We try to get them in for a six month, <laughs> but you know, you know how it is. Uh, they just stop calling, you know, they stop. Yeah. Returning our especially calls. if it worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but Bane's better. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done if here. It worked or the, or it didn't work and they went on to something else. Right. Right. Have you ever done any retreatments for patients who either have residual or recurrent pain? We have when I would offer that if I thought there was something technically incomplete about okay. my treatment. Sure. And so when we were treating only medial or only lateral and a patient had lackluster results, we would offer to do it again and treat that other uh, compartment. Actually, not that many patients took us up on that. Um, but uh, I guess what I would do also for that kind of patient is if I didn't think that a repeat treatment would bring about a better result, I think I would just make sure that their conservative strategies were being optimized. It usually isn't, you know, honestly, what's it called? The, the orthopedic surgery society, I forgot what it's called, but OAS or something like that there, their guidelines, their management guidelines just came out of uh, the end of the year. And it seems like the best things for these patients and are just education, structured exercise, um, it may be even a little bit of physical therapy, but maybe just as important is just uh, kind of a guided exercise program that they keep up with along with education can, can actually prevent a lot of total knee replacements if all that is just optimized. And you know, patients really don't get that, you know, in a really uh, like aggressive way that, uh, that the doctor and the patient is consistent about, um, and 
dedicated to adopting. So I, I try to encourage that the patient to follow those things and to get to a, a physical therapist that I know can teach them those things. I'm also considering genicular nerve ablation. I just read the, the paper that compared GAE with uh, genicular nerve ablation and visco or injections, visco sup and steroid injections. And the ablation patients in the meta-analysis actually did pretty well. And so I, I've always, you know, I assume that it has success rate and recurrence issues. And I think that our treatment is probably better in those regards, you know, as, as far as recurrence goes, but um, ablation may be a good second choice as well if, if GAE didn't work. Yeah. Well, that's really about all I've got. One more question I have uh, is wondering if you have any advice to any physicians in the outpatient setting out there who are interested in, in starting GAE in their practice? I think it's, yes, I think it's important to remember that this is a doctor's office and this is, this is that office that like your old GP, you know, used to work in, uh, the, you know, the, the doctor down the street that just hung a shingle. These procedures can be done in that same kind of office, these treatments, and yet you just get some supplies, get some equipment, get a few people, and you could be doing these and um, collecting a tremendous reimbursement for them. And the insurance companies are happy to give it to you because um, it's the cheapest way to get these patients treated. Right. Uh, so I, that's really powerful. You know, that's that's a big deal. This I think this is probably the the highest reimbursing forty five minutes in a doctor's office. Hey, is there anything else that are reimburses better in 45 minutes in a doctor's office? I guess if you consider like the pre-op and the recovery, you could, you know, call it a two or three hours, but still there can't, I don't think there's anything like this. And that makes it uh, a huge opportunity for us. Yeah. Um, but it also kind of makes it a target. You know, wh who controls the office now? Who controls doctors' offices now? 70% of doctors, like primary care doctors, work for a uh, big hospital system now. You know, their, their practices are, have been acquired. There's been a huge um, run of acquisitions in that area where hospitals and private equity companies are buying um, doctors' offices. And th they control the office. And... Who do you, you know, you know that they have CFOs and accountants that are looking at this stuff. What do you think they're going to do when they hear that they can get $10,000 for 45 minutes of work by doing arterial embolizations in a doctor's office? You don't even need an ASC to do these. They haven't yet, but that's going to get somebody's attention. You know, and their consultants at some point there, when they go to their conferences, these hospital people are going to go to conferences and their consultants are going to be telling them, hey, you know, you have all these doctors, you have a thousand doctors in your network, you have hundreds of thousands of patients, you should, this is something you should do <laughs> and keep it, don't refer it out, keep right. it in, keep it in the network. So I think, um, people who want to start a GAE practice, um, I, I think that it's important to plan for how you're going to fit in to the healthcare paradigm that's coming, the health, the healthcare paradigm of huge hospital consolidated networks owning doctors' offices, and how are we going to fit in? You know that doctor who may have you may have relied upon to be loyal to you and send you patients may not always be able to if they've been acquired, and they're having hospital people tell them where they can or can't send patients and just keep patients in the network. And you know, when hospitals start doing this, they're going to mess it up. They're going to ruin it <laughs> when hospitals control it, you know, versus what, what you and I can do as independent doctors, what are hospitals are going to, they're going to, the prices are going to go up. They have higher contracted rates. Patients are going to wait a long time. People are going to be mean to them. And then it's all going to just get kind of messed up. So I think that's a shame. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a shame. But I think more to answer your question, we all need to think about what, where we're going to fit into that, you know, and it's, it's not just a matter of 
doing good work, that's crucial, of course, doing good work, making patients happy, making doctors happy. But it's also about making partnerships, friendships and partnerships and um, loyal partnerships and some, sometimes even uh, financial or business partnerships, you know, to, to kind of stake your place in that, in that network dominated paradigm. And so I guess that I would leave it at that. I don't have the answer to how the, how, what the best way is to ensure that we'll, we'll all have a place, you know, in, in introducing GAE to an OBL practice. Uh, but that's certainly a major consideration for all of us. Absolutely. This has been very enlightening. Thank you very much for sharing your Saturday and your perspective with us. Uh, that's about all I got. Awesome. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you. Have a good day. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang and newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.